you hear me? Uh, Pavan, I think you are still muted. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Upal. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Hello, how are you? I'm doing good. Is the audio quality acceptable? I have a special. Yeah. Mic. Okay, excellent. Yeah, yeah. It it it's, it's great. Uh, one thing I need to first do. Uh, give me one second. Uh, there is this host role. I have to assume. Um. Let me also do a quick screen share testing. One moment. So, mm -hmm. you know, I yeah. converted everything to a PDF to keep it simple. I don't know. Nice. <laughs> uh, how do we do screen share? You know, share, I see. Okay. And screen notification. Should I? Let's do application because I don't have much going on here. So, if I maximize it or if I say full screen, does it show full screen more? What, what yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, this looks nice. Good. Well, thank you so much, Wupal, for organizing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, hopefully, it's going to be interesting and exciting. So I've been pushing it out to my colleagues. I don't think they're going to come, but at least I think. Uh, oh, okay. It's it's visible inside of ASU that this is happening. <laughs> okay. That that that's that's really great. Yeah. We uh, I mean we also like send out to but so because this is like San Diego. Uh, IEEE San Diego section. We're part of IEEE San Diego section, mm -hmm. so it is. It gets advertised to the like IEEE members. So so there are uh, co quite a lot of members. But yeah, not so so many people sign up, but <laughs> don't get yeah. Yeah. discouraged if like no 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 problem. Like, yeah. Uh, uh yeah but, but I'm, I'm here for you i'm, yeah. I'm presenting yeah. for you that's my thank best you slide. so much yeah <laughs> uh, also is it okay to record usually we, no. we record no that's fine but you know i i first of all wanted to say this is very impressive that you're doing a society chapter meeting series okay yeah i think we can start uh hi everyone uh uh, my name is Upal Mahabub. I'm serving as the chair of IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter for this year. And I'd like to welcome you all to the seventh talk of the invited seminar series organized by our chapter. We are delighted to have Professor Pavan Turaga as our guest speaker today. Professor Turaga is a distinguished professor at Arizona State University and he's affiliated with the School of Arts, Media and Engineering and the School of Electrical, Computer and Energy Engineering. His research spans various data types, including time series, images, videos, and 3D point clouds with many applications, such as in interactive systems, machine learning, computer vision, and mobile health. Uh, Professor Thuraga has received accolades uh, such as the National Science Foundation's Career Award, uh, a breast pepper uh, honorable mention from IEEE Wagby in 2021, and a breast pepper award from the Computational Cameras and Displays Workshop in 2015. Uh, he has served in notable roles, including co chair of the Differential Geometry in Computer Vision and Machine Learning, or, uh, that's a workshop series. Associate Editor of the IEEE Transactions on Image Processing and the Elsevier Pattern Recognition Journal, and Program Co-Chair or Committee Member for conferences like IEEE Face and Gesture uh, 2021 and International Joint Conference or, on Artificial Intelligence, ICHKAI uh, 2019. At ASU, uh, Professor Turaga is affiliated with prominent research centers such as Center for Sensor Signal Information Processing, the Center for Human Artificial Intelligence and Robot Teaming, and the Center for Innovation in Healthy and Resilient Aging, uh, and also the Simon A. Levine Mathematical Computational and Modeling Sciences Center. In today's lecture, uh, Professor Turaga is going to provide us insights about how the robustness of ML methods can be improved using geometric approaches. So, without further delay, uh, Pavan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Rupal. It's an honor to be here with all of you, and thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, let me just dive straight into the presentation. Uh, quick screen share and making it full screen. Let me know if it's full screen now. Is it okay, Rupal? Yeah. So, thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, the title of my talk is, you know, when data is scarce and stakes are high, and how can geometric approaches uh, help? 
advanced robust machine learning in those types of scenarios. Uh, so this is a summary of many different types of uh, applications that we pursued in the lab that I run at ASU. It's called the Geometric Media Lab. Uh, and it's a very, you know, carefully thought out name uh, in a way that doesn't tie us down to a specific type of media. And as Upal has mentioned, we do work in uh, a variety of media industries and so to speak, which is sensor data, time series, imaging, video, 3D and more. Uh, but the common thread that ties our work across all these different uh, media is the techniques we use to process, to represent and to infer things from that media. Uh, we use a body of work uh, called geometric methods, which itself is a very vast area of work in mathematics, but we have been trying to transition some of these methods into applied practice in machine learning. Uh, why geometric methods? Uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, you will have some empirical examples as to why they are helpful, but if you want an overarching theme as to why geometry is interesting, here is a couple of tidbits that motivated me to go on this path. Uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, I was in electrical engineering, you know, uh, very much like uh, Upal, and I was studying a class on control theory or systems theory, linear systems theory. How do you explain observed time series with differential equations, that kind of stuff. Uh, and somewhere in the introduction, this was a book on nonlinear control by uh, Khalil, which is a very classic text on the topic. Uh, somewhere in the introduction, the author says that in engineering, especially electrical engineering, it seems like we teach students a lot about linear things, linear filtering, linear systems, linear algebra. Everything is linear as if it's special and everything that's nonlinear is considered an anomaly. So, and anytime we confront nonlinear things, we linearize them as if that's the only thing you have. Uh, but then, he ends with saying nonlinearity is the normal and linearity is special. There is nothing in nature that actually is a linear system and everything that is found in nature is a nonlinear system. So you might as well develop the language and the tools to deal with that complexity rather than special tools like linear things. So that was a revelation to me and uh, that set me down the path of understanding nonlinear things, which leads you directly into geometric things and it's a huge, 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 vast field. Uh, there's many types of geometries. There's many types of nonlinear things that you can do. And I just believe that I've been very fortunate in connecting the right tool with the right application over the past decade. And the field is still very ripe to make those connections. Uh, it's very underexplored and the payoffs are very obvious once you make those connections. So at the end of this talk, maybe you'll see what those payoffs are. Uh, so, uh, the title, of course, is uh, geometry, but also high stakes. So, what do we mean by high stakes machine learning? Uh, machine learning clearly is uh, very, very, you know, popular at this point of time, and there's many, many industry use cases for that. Uh, but oftentimes, when you speak to folks who work on mission critical things, uh, things like health promotion, diagnosing, you know, something or, you know, DOD, where you have to have guarantees that when you detect something, it is actually the thing that you're going after and it's, uh, you know, robust to uh, adversarial, you know, things like, you know, paint and color and texture. So mission critical things where the cost of a wrong decision is high. That's what I mean by high stakes. In those areas, uh, machine learning is still viewed with a big deal of suspicion and understandably so. Uh, 101 machine learning, 101 pattern recognition, graduate class, you start with this notion called cost function of binary classification. If you got, made a mistake, the cost is one. If you did not make a mistake, the cost is zero. And in neural networks world, we call that the binary cross entropy loss. And it's still the standard in machine learning because someone arbitrarily decided that the cost of making a mistake is one whatever that means. So whereas in high stakes applications, we have no way of quantifying the cost of that mistake, like in real sense, like the cost of a person's life, who knows what that number is. And therefore in these applications, ML is seen with suspicion. So what can we do uh, in addition to, I mean, it's not, we're not gonna be in a position to uh, develop a whole new paradigm of machine learning. That's not gonna happen in the near future. We still have to work with existing paradigms. But then how can we robustify them? How can we improve their interpretability? And uh, how can we uh, advance uh, the reliability in these scenarios with more basic understanding of the phenomena in which they are being applied? 
So I'll touch upon at least two things in this talk. One is uh, health and uh, wearables, which uh, that's a very big market that's growing. And the other is computer vision, where you're looking at pictures and detecting and classifying objects and what you can do over there. Uh, but high stakes is more than just this. High stakes applications are uh, way more than can be enumerated, but our personal, you know, my lab interests are roughly in these areas, precision health, autonomous systems, uh, a bit in material science, there is a lot of stuff happening in materials discovery and predicting structure from function, that kind of stuff, or predicting function from structure, that kind of stuff. And also media and experience systems, uh, things like, uh, you know, virtual worlds, where uh, right now, of course, the answer is, uh, well, uh, who cares how the world looks, but if those things do become mainstream, it's going to have an impact on our health. It's going to have an impact on how we trust people in virtual worlds. So things will be high stakes soon, even in virtual worlds. So those are all upcoming. Uh, I will start with wearables. I think given the time I have, I might uh, be able to cover our work in wearables as a motivating example, go very briefly into medical imaging and then into vision systems. I don't think I'll have enough time to talk about the work we're doing with scientific applications, but I'll mention that. Uh, the core approach in all the work we do is uh, to understand the underlying variables that lead to the observed distributions. Uh, data science, machine learning, pattern recognition often starts with the idea that, oh, there is a data distribution, it's given to you, now transform it in different ways so you have some end job done for you. But the field does not give us the tools to understand why is the distribution the way it is? If it is Gaussian, why is it Gaussian? If it is multiples of, I mean, like mixtures of Gaussians, why is it mixtures of Gaussians? The why is almost always relegated to, oh, that's the science of whatever, the physics of image formation, or, oh, biomechanics, oh, material science people probably know why it is so, and we don't need to worry about it. So that is the interface where I beg to differ that if you want to create effective machine learning tools, you also have to understand the why the data distribution is the way it is. And once in an odd while, you can express that constraint in very nice, elegant ways. And if you can do that, you'll see some multiplier effect on performance. So variables, what's the issue? So why the promise? So the promise is clear, and this is of course pre-COVID, you know, this graphic was from pre-COVID days. Uh, variables for fitness tracking, Fitbit, like devices, they are growing steadily. Uh, many studies came out uh, around this time, around 2019, that said that, uh, that pointed to the notion that even Fitbit-based analytics of human activity is very sensitive to things like body type, body shape, BMI. Uh, they would miscount things if you were someone who's uh, high on the BMI scale. Uh, they would miscount the number of steps you take because you walk slow, that kind of stuff would happen. Or if you were swimming, Swimming would not be counted as activity because someone decided not to include swimming as one of the categories that models were trained on. So there were all kinds of issues uh, uh, with relying on uh, machine learning analytics, even for wearables. Uh, we decided to, you know, take a second look at the problem, and uh, we were also motivated by the notion that the future of wearables is going to be small form factors, self-powered devices. 24-7 wear, unobtrusive uh, locations, where you may have very, very long signal recordings. We are not talking about taking two seconds of data and classifying it. We might potentially have a situation where sampling rates are going to be extremely high. Uh, 100 hertz and above is common even now, but then multiply that with 24-7 recording, very, very long signals. How will you deal with that uh, in contemporary ML without... Uh, you know, overwhelming the modeling side of things. So here is uh, what a sample signal overlay looks like from a very standard, uh, you know, IMU device, which works at 100 hertz. Uh, and this is a person walking on a treadmill at one mile per hour, the most structured activity that you can imagine. This is not someone walking in a park doing whatever they want. They are on a treadmill and the speed is controlled. So even under this controlled condition, uh, the signals don't look very, um, like it's hard to say if this is a constant speed walking activity. So there is already that amount of variability even under that constrained condition. But why is there that variability? Uh, if you look at uh, results in biomechanics, you will start seeing why. So here is a sample overlay. These are uh, 100 different recordings of uh, 10 seconds each. So 100 hertz sampling rate, uh, 10 seconds means 1,000 samples. So the time series has 1,000 samples. 
and it, this is just a vector overlay so it's just what the scatter plot would look like if you were to visualize this in high dimensional space except we can't visualize this in high dimensional space so this is just signals overlaid on each other so this is the statistical distribution of these raw signals as vectors if you will and most of ml would say well let's try to reduce this variation uh, and reduce the complexity so that it looks somewhat tightly clustered around something nice and predictable. Uh, feature extraction is still considered standard in uh, wearables and you know, deep learning is still just making its inroads uh, because uh, people like to interpret the features in specific ways. Uh, but feature extraction, even with deep learning, will lose detail. These are extremely detailed time series. There are, there are very interesting peaks and valleys that will not be captured in a reductive representational process. But first of all, this variation is problematic. This looks like there is no structure to this stack. It just looks like noise. Can we condition this somehow uh, in a way that is informed by basic phenomena? The why, why is there this variability? So uh, this is when I, if this were a student uh, given this task, I would tell them here, go read this book on biomechanics to see how people think about human movement. There are at least four different variabilities and this is like minimum. Uh, one is uh, recording problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, sampling rates are variable. So sensors are not always working at 100 hertz, like we are taught in EE textbooks, sampling rates vary, which means some parts of the signal might be oversampled, some parts might be undersampled. So when you look at it like this, some parts will be stretched and some parts will be skewed. Uh, then humans do not walk in or the, their actions are not periodic. There is some amount of variation in how we just do daily activities. Uh, sometimes we overweight on one side and less on the other side, and that's helpful in maintaining balance, actually. Uh, biomechanics says variability is a sign of health. Uh, the more we age, our variability reduces. So we start taking small steps in very periodic ways, and that is seen as a sign of loss of motor control and balance. So that is a remarkable result. When I first started reading that literature, I was like, oh, so again, the lack of periodicity is actually a sign of health. Whereas my EE ways of thinking would say, oh my God, I don't want to deal with that lack of periodicity. I would like them to be periodic. So again, the more you understand the basics, uh, the more it changes how you want to work with the data. Uh, then uh, we don't always attach uh, sensors exactly at the same point uh, on our bodies. And that has a very interesting effect. It changes, uh, you know, uh, if you like to think of the human body as a nonlinear dynamic system, you're changing the measurement equation every time you attach the sensor, it's changing just by a little bit, uh, but it has a noticeable effect on the recorded signals. And then body type, gender, demographic variables, we don't even have mathematical models to describe that. That's where ML should come in. But prior to that, uh, phase variables, you know, sensor sampling rate variables, the changes because of placement, there are some mathematical models that can be brought to bear and they should be brought to bear before we dump it to ML. And that's what we are gonna do here. Uh, the first, uh, some of these variables uh, that I just mentioned, sampling rate and, you know, intrinsic variations in how people move, uh, there is a very convenient model to think about uh, what that actually does to the signal. It really stretches the signal in some spaces and shrinks them in some spaces, but uh, different ways and different times. Uh, in speech processing, it's the same phenomena is observed. Uh, back in the 1980s, there was this set of techniques called dynamic time warping, which were invented to compare two speech signals. Because same thing, when I say the word apple, if I say that a hundred times, my signal will look different and different parts of uh, the word would be stretched out or shrunk. And uh, how do you account for that? Uh, you basically are looking at transformations of the time axis and uh, diffeomorphic time warps are uh, the right way to think about that. Uh, diffeomorphic time warps look like this panel in the middle where you're taking, where, you know, this is a mapping function between time to time. So some parts of the, if this were a straight line, if this were a diagonally straight line, it means that there was no time warp. Uh, any other uh, angle to it would say it was stretched or skewed in some specific way. Given two signals, there are very well-established methods to estimate the optimal time warp function, and that is called dynamic time warping. However, given a stack of signals like we have, I give you a hundred recordings of someone walking, and then I say, well, can you clean this up? There is no technique to do that uh, until very recently. So that method that can take a stack of signals and kind of clean it up, and I'll mention what that means, 
uh, with the understanding that perhaps there is some underlying clean signal or, or an underlying template signal that is being warped in different ways each time you record it. Uh, so that decomposition of the stack into one clean template and a stack of deformation functions that change the time axis is called phase amplitude separation. And also uh, it's also called, uh, it's also part of a field called functional data analysis. This is a branch of mathematics, uh, a sub branch of geometry, where you talk about the geometry of functions. Uh, why functions? Uh, functions are uh, interesting to think about as, uh, you know, as your sampling rate tends to infinity, you might want to think of your signals as functions rather than as discrete samples of, you know, a continuous thing. Uh, thinking about those as continuous functions gives you access to these tools. It's not that we are not discretizing things. We are working in discrete spaces, but uh, the decomposition method is written down in continuous form. And then we push discretization as far as as far into the pipeline as possible. Uh, that's another of the tricks we employ uh, in our work, which is uh, we try to work in the full complexity of the problem as much as possible before we employ the discretization, the feature extraction, the simplifying models of uh, machine learning. So until this point, there is no machine learning. Uh, what we're doing is signal decomposition into a, a template function. So the bottom right uh, panel, the blue curve that you're seeing is the cleaned up average signal that has been estimated from this stack. And uh, each of these observed signals is a temporal uh, composition. It's a function composition of this blue signal with one of these warping functions on this panel. So it's 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 like a time, it's like frequency and amplitude separation. So that's where the terminology is coming from, but it's not really that. It's uh, the, the thing we're going after is decomposing functions as uh, a basic clean function, which is composed of a time warping function. Is it working? Is it doing anything? The way to think about that is now look at the blue curve. Uh, now, from here, from the blue curve, uh, you can now align all this noisy stack to map with this blue curve. So the peaks and valleys can be aligned. Uh, so, and then after it's aligned, you can just average them and look at some standard deviation envelopes. So now what we're seeing is that the standard deviation envelopes, which are the red and the green curves, are very tightly hugging that mean signal, which means the variation has been reduced. If I were to take this and visualize this as a point cloud in high dimensional feature space, the the cluster will be much tighter now as opposed to how I originally began. And now this is where we say, all right, this is what I could do with a basic understanding of how time series is affected from by the human body. After this, I don't have any other mathematical models to explain this further. Now machine learning can take over in taking this cleaned up data and doing something with it. And that's what we do. So uh, we have this uh, internally collected data set from our uh, colleagues from the College of Health Solutions who are interested in uh, interventions for pre-diabetic adults, uh, where uh, they have been doing these 24 seven recordings of people with Fitbits doing daily activities. Now, this is a sampling of seven types of daily activities that they were prescribed. This is a set from a bigger set of 14 or 20. And uh, it differs very much from publicly available data sets uh, of human activity recognition. Some are nice, you know, walking on treadmills, those are good, uh, good in the sense of easy to model. Uh, but then there are these other things which are seated or folding and stacking laundry and standing and fidgeting with hand while walking or talking uh, things that don't really have a sample template like these are very bizarre classes that have very high variability uh, and public data sets don't have anything like this so it's a challenging problem uh, but here are some results that we have uh, this is pre-deep learning we just wanted to see if this in, in this initial cleaning up helps uh, once you clean up these signals uh, and then you do some basic feature extraction and use some SVM type of classifier, uh, the baseline results are this. Uh, the trends are predictable. Uh, as the signal length increases, the classification uh, performance increases. Uh, but then when you do the same pipeline, but just the input is different now. The input are these uh, phase amplitude separated signals, so they're cleaner. Uh, we see bumps in performance all through, and uh, the bumps are much higher as the signal length is reduced. So the reduction of variance is helping when 
conditions for testing are getting harder and harder. So this is extremely uh, interesting for us, but of course it comes at a price, which is the cleanup takes time, all that is there. But this is a, a very uh, initial uh, experiment we did uh, to showcase the benefit of working and thinking through the why the variability exists. If you completely disregard the why, you have the first row. So that's where your performance bumps are coming. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, this type of thinking does not require more training data sets. This is, we are changing nothing in the training set. It does not require a more complicated machine learning models. We are working with exactly the same model in both rows. So the bump in performance is fully attributable to asking why the variabilities exist and countering for that upfront. Uh, now, this part of a whole other body of work in our lab, which is, okay, now we work with feature extraction and SVMs. Can we do a deep learning variation to it? And yes, yes, you can. Uh, I will not go into the full details, but yes, we were able to embed a differentiable layer that did something like time warping, uh, but it's not exactly a replica of time warping. It kind of has some of the constraints of time warp functions built in. And uh, when you pair it with an end-to-end -end classifying model, we found some other interesting effects that uh, we were getting time warps that would promote classification accuracy even higher, uh, whereas that was missing in the previous one. We had a uh, you know time warp happening se separately and classifiers working separately, but when they are blended, now the time warp and classifiers work synergistically, so the time warp functions are now discriminative. So that's a very interesting phenomena we observed, uh, which is uh, which has no analog in uh, the old ways of thinking about. Uh, aligning signals, for example. Uh, as a quick overview of results, yes, uh, we this is on a public data set on motion capture. Uh, lots of baseline algorithms, uh, you know, were tried and we our module is a drop-in module. Again, it doesn't compete with anything that you want to work with. It is a drop-in module that goes into your network of choice and it bumps up performance. The only difference is uh, the way we are treating some latent variables and uh, asking them to look like time warp functions and treating them like time warp functions in the network architecture. It's just a plug and drop in module uh, and we see real bumps in performance across the board. Uh, for yes. uh, like that does doing the time warping like you did for the VM like classifiers uh, that, that does like not in a trainable manner, but just doing it and then training a deep neural network helps. Oh, absolutely! Like 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 a pre-processing step. Yeah. Yes, it it helps too. I mean, uh, I'd say we didn't have to do it because someone else in the community did that for okay. us. You know, there was other papers published in the intermediate stages, and okay. uh, I think uh, you know we established the idea that cleaning this up in this way helps for variable data analysis, and it sparked. Community work and yes, some people use it as pre training or pre cleaning up and they used it just with deep nets as is that also helped. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll skip some of this. Uh, these are variations on that. So, coming to the vision side of things, the medical imaging and vision side of things. Uh, so, in the wearable side, you know, there is one little. You know, advantage of asking this why question. Uh, because time series and their features are uh, more easily visualized and you can see, uh, you know, you can do these types of decompositions, you know, even time frequency decompositions and interpret what is going on in the time series. Uh, such intuitions don't quite work well for imaging data. Uh, for uh, if you take a picture and data frequency decomposition in two dimensions, it's extremely hard to interpret what you're seeing. Uh, so some of those intuitions get harder in uh, imaging and you require a different set of tools uh, to get similar types of insights. And I'll talk about some of our uh, work in that area. Uh, so neural architectures are uh, way more adopted in imaging than they are in time series, even to this day. Uh, and, you know, neural architectures like this are very common. This is AlexNet from 2012, and this is not even the not even close to being the largest neural architecture that is common these days. But as you can see, there's uh, so many parameters uh, that uh, people tune for specific tasks like image classification, uh, making it extremely hard to understand uh, or encode uh, why there is variables or why there is variation in the data set and what should I do with this network to structure it in a way that reduces variation. It's very hard to say. Some of the early experiments, now this is not us, this is how the field is progressing. Some of the early experiments on trying to understand deep nets involved looking at 
the feature extracting layers, you know, those convolutional layers, looking at what are those filters learning to do. And they came up with these very interesting visualizations. Depending upon architecture, they would say they look like edge detection filters on the low level. And as you go deeper and deeper into the network, they start looking like object detectors. Uh, so this was done uh, uh, by many groups, uh, but one of the things uh, that persisted, the problems th that persisted were beyond a point, you could never really interpret uh, the features that they were learning. Uh, and at some point, it just became pure speculation as to what they were trying to do. And it was almost like a rationalization, like someone were to give you, I don't know, let's say, look at, let's look at these chairs. If I did tell you that, if I did not call these chairs, but I just gave you the set of pictures and I said, what do they look like? Very hard to say they are chairs. So there is a lot of rationalization that happens by knowledge of the classes that were in the training set and trying to associate one of those classes with one of these filters. But there is no natural interpretation coming up. Uh, one of the other uh, examples that is used very commonly in medical imaging is the notion of uh, uh, identifying regions of the image that lead to certain decisions. Uh, there is a technique called grad cam, which takes a picture as input and highlights parts of the picture that seem to have contributed maximally to the final decision, which is interesting. I mean, the intent was good because uh, the intent for uh, that sort of techniques was this is probably how humans understand if you say well this chest x-ray looks like pneumonia or covid or what have you in addition to just saying it is pneumonia can you identify the region in the chest x-ray that contributed to that decision maybe it's interpretable uh, the intention going in was right but uh, the effects were still not good enough because uh, these methods were uh, still very blunt. They would identify very large parts of the image and sometimes not even relevant parts of the image. Uh, and, uh, you know, the shapes didn't really mean anything. So there was a lot left to the interpretation still. But it's still a good workhorse in trying to interpret what's happening in these uh, networks. The other interesting thing that people are trying to do now is uh, generating counterfactuals, which is... Uh, Again, same thing, it's very common in medical imaging, but it's also increasingly common in general computer vision applications, which is take a picture, uh, but then modify it in a way that flips your decision. Uh, it's very related to this other body of work, which is called adversarial attacks, uh, where you also modify a picture, which causes the decision to flip. The difference between generating an adversarial example versus a counterfactual is the adversarial example can be extremely subtle. You might get away with tweaking one pixel in some very fancy spot in a way that is imperceptible. In the counterfactual ways of thinking about it, we want to modify it in some physically meaningful, smooth, interpretable way so that when you show this to a person, the difference is perceptible and meaningful. So it's still very similar framework. We are trying to optimize for modifications of the input. Uh, but in this case, we are uh, adding some smoothness loss terms where we want to change the input in some smooth ways so that it's physically perceptible. When you do that, it creates a whole lot of interesting toolkits for understanding uh, what's going on and why, what is going on at the data set level uh, also, and I'll show you that soon. Uh, one of the things you can do that do here is called, is called progressive counterfactuals. You can uh, ask it to modify it in degrees of uh, severity uh, and so that the output is increasingly confident in one thing or the other. And uh, in this case, we're taking a normal chest X-ray and converting it to a pneumonia class. And uh, the way you trust the model is doing its job is, yes, it's adding this fuzzy, hazy structures where the lungs should be. So that's a visualization. It's not an objective assessment of reliability, but it's uh, one of the tools that you can have as a part of your toolkit to assess whether it's understanding the phenomena of pneumonia better. One of the interesting things it can do is to let you understand what in the data set is a source of variability that you're not aware of. Uh, here is an example. So you take a query from a normal class, you create a counterfactual, and sometimes it creates these very similar looking pictures which perceptibly look very close, but then you have a difference image, right? You just subtract the two and you see which parts are highlighted. In one case, we found that there is this uh, interesting highlight on the bottom, on the top left corner, uh, which we were intrigued by. And when we zoomed in, 
again, it looks like this bloody mess. So we went back to the pictures to see what was going on on these top left corners. It turned out that a clinician was writing you know, like with their hands on the top left, the diagnosis. So this network architecture has learned to basically modify, basically scribble on the top left, the word pneumonia, and uh, the network was learning to classify that as pneumonia. So we know very well then that, oh, this is a sign that the network has overfitted to a feature that should never have been in the database. But we had no way of knowing that until we generated these counterfactuals and looked at those different images. So again, uh, this is a very interesting way to understand the phenomena of how people enter decisions and how these things can have very unusual impacts on machine learning models. As a human, you probably would not pay attention to the top left uh, scribble, but ML can. And these are the kinds of tools that you need to trust these models. Uh, some of the very recent work we're doing uh, in imaging is to promote shape awareness, uh, which also comes from uh, that line of thinking that uh, let's understand the sources of variability in pictures. Uh, shape is particularly interesting to think about. Uh, in computer vision, when I was in graduate school, you know, uh, we, we used to have modules in a vision class where module one would be understanding motion, module two would be understanding surface reflectance and this module three would be understanding shape models and then how do they all combine how does a moving shape of a specific convexity with a specific reflectance type create interesting uh, gradients on a picture so we would understand the physics of image formation from these basic models of shape light surface and motion uh, but a graduate class in computer vision now starts with neural networks where we don't talk about these things so i always like to go back to these basics, uh, not in a way to, uh, you know, choose not to work with neural architectures, but, the, but to make them more robust and reliable. This is an example of a, a very obvious, uh, you know, a very popular example, not even ours, it comes from uh, other, other researchers. You take a picture of an elephant's skin texture, you take a picture of a cat, and you paint the cat with the elephant's skin texture, and uh, most most object recognition methods would fail under this testing condition. Uh, this is an example of what happens uh, classified as Indian elephant with extremely high confidence. And this is still true even to this day that these kinds of confusions happened. Uh, there is a, a, a hypothesis that uh, because the way neural networks are structured, you know, you have these convolutional operations which uh, people like, but convolution is a local operation. It modifies, you know, it processes of a small set of pixels in a neighborhood at a time. Uh, which are the classic things you do when you try to extract what is called gradient features, which is very connected to understanding texture in pictures. When you take a class or you take a module in shape analysis, you never start with the notion of convolution. Uh, you start with the notion of linking together edges over a very wide receptive field in a way that's smooth, coherent, continuous. So the way to think about shape is fundamentally different than the way we think about color and texture. Uh, but the way neural networks process pictures is generally biased towards how we think about color and texture. It does not have the mathematical functions that are needed to process shape. That's a big claim. And uh, I personally have studied shape analysis for a very long time which is also very closely connected to geometry, and therefore I make these bold claims. So what are the types of mathematics you need to understand shape? Uh, it's a very, very rich and broad field. Uh, the most contemporary advancements I will not even touch upon. I'm going back to the 60s, a method known as a shape moments. Uh, uh, this was published as a general paper by M.K. Hugh in a very odd journal. It was uh, the Transactions on Information Theory or something the IRE transactions on information theory. This is pre-IEEE. <laughs> IEEE didn't exist then. Uh, and uh, published in information theory because the transactions on image processing didn't exist then and PAMI didn't exist then. So he came up with a way uh, to describe pictures of objects which had been uh, segmented, meaning uh, the background would be black and uh, the picture, the, the object of interest would be just white. So these would be binary pictures of blobs which were white. Uh, he wanted to come up with a description of that blob in a way that uh, encoded the shape and not necessarily 
the size of the object. So he was looking at rotation, translation, scale invariant descriptors for a binary blob. Uh, his idea was to think about uh, projections of the picture onto a polynomial type set of basis functions. So the mathematical operation looks like this. This is a projection. You take the picture, you project it onto another picture, but the picture looks like x to the power p, y to the power q. So it's like polynomials. One, one easy way to think about these is if this were p equals 2, q equals 2, x square, y square, it's like a quadratic function on your image grid. When you look at it as a picture, it would look like a nice circular blob. But then if you add more degrees to it, x cube, y cube would look more funky and x, you know, it can get very funky. But the basic blob, x square, y square is, you know, simple quadratic. It would look like a nice blob in two dimensions. So he was trying to describe shapes as a decomposition onto these polynomial functions, which could very weakly be considered as, you know, different blob shapes that could describe a picture and some summations of those things. Uh, that type of projection leads to uh, what is called a moment in physics in like uh, the physics of interacting bodies, you know, Newtonian mechanics ways of talking about moment. You do talk about very similar things. We talk of these things as moments of inertia, center of gravity, that's like that type of stuff. So this has roots in uh, understanding uh, the shape of a bunch of interacting objects. Uh, from physics, but those are not rotation, translation, scale invariant. So he went through his contribution was not this equation. His contribution was the set of equations on the bottom, where he processed these basic moments in very careful ways uh, to prove that these seven numbers that he would come up with would be rotation, translation, scale invariant. It's I think brilliant. I would never know how to come up with these equations, but this was feature engineering in the sixties, very detailed feature engineering. But the basic idea is the math that you need to represent shape is of this type. It is not of the convolutional type. It is not of the, uh, you know, uh, simple A dot B type. Uh, it is A dot B, but the A is super complicated. It's a polynomial type function. So this is uh, the beginnings of shape analysis. And uh, through the 80s, through the 90s, many, many, many variations of shape analysis have been proposed, and they're even more intricate than this. None of them look like a convolutional operation anywhere. So how do you take these ideas of how to represent shapes and begin to blend them to neural networks? Uh, this is very recent work from our group, uh, 2023, just published last month in uh, CVPR, uh, a workshop paper and a main conference paper. Here was our idea. We'd say, uh, let's look at this architecture. The top uh, pipeline looks very much like a standard image classifier, you know, resonant blocks stacked together, uh, and uh, you train it end to end to get a classification. But on the bottom, again, we have this drop in module, which can go with nearly any image classifier on the top, uh, where what we do is uh, you know, this might, the top layer might still do convolutional operations, no problem. That's our texture pipeline. Uh, the bottom is a geometry pipeline where the input is not your pixel colors. The input is a coordinate grid and it is being warred with affine transforms and we are learning affine transforms that should be applied to this coordinate grid. And we are learning for it to regress polynomial type basis functions that when you take a dot product with at the feature level leads to high classification accuracies. So the bottom pipeline is very, very unusual uh, compared to how standard deep nets work. We are processing the coordinate grid here and uh, we are learning functions of that grid and learning to transform them with affine transforms to get some affine invariance in the features. And then the fusion with the top pipeline is through Hadamard products and uh, that's, that's the way we fuse them and end-to-end -end training is possible. So what do these things do? So first of all, numerically, uh, they help. Uh, you know, uh, we tested these ideas on ImageNet and Cifra data sets. Maybe the one number to look at to get a quick overview uh, is, let's look at the number of parameters and accuracies on the second table. We can work with most types of classification networks. So again, our modules are drop-in modules. These are not competing with standard modules. These will work well with standard modules. We drop in this bottom half, and when you drop it in, we see bumps in performance again and again and again. Modest bumps in performance, not ginormous, but uh, they are there. Uh, on CIFR, the bumps in performance are even more significant. 
uh, we add very few additional parameters. It's not like we're doubling the number of network parameters. You see the number of parameters sometimes is even less uh, than the original, but we see huge improvements in understanding other things about the network's performance. Just like the grad cam picture I showed you earlier, you take this picture and you say, what in the picture did you pay attention to, to reach your decision? The standard grad cam you know, approach creates these visualizations, which uh, do a good job of locating the region of interest, but they don't do a good job of uh, getting the detailed shape out. So uh, ResNet, you know, uh, if you just directly visualize the features of a ResNet block deep into the network, it look it's beginning to look like shape, uh, but uh, still pretty blobby. But then when you drop in our shape awareness modules to the ResNet model, the shape less increases. We are able to get features that look very detailed shape like things. And this is the impact we are having uh, by understanding how shape is represented. The mathematics of shape is fundamentally different than color texture processing. And when you blend that in, uh, we are able to highlight the shape related structures of the pictures. Uh, we also uh, find that, yes, open uh, question. Okay. Yeah. So I saw, I think in the um, like uh, framework, there were two different so here. levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we actually use, we've experimented with more than five and up to 10 levels actually, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So that's basically, uh, uh, depending on ablation studies, you right. kind of determine what's a good choice for number of levels, okay. Right, right. Uh, so, I mean, it's interesting. So we we stopped at level five for the submission, but then yes, exactly. One of the reviewer question was why why level five? Why not more? And then we went up to level ten. So we found that as you add more levels, the final features highlight more and more you know shape related stuff. Beyond a point, it doesn't help clearly. I mean, once the shape is highlighted, it doesn't add much more value. Uh, and of course, the more parameters you add, there is that additional overhead of just increasing parameters. We don't want to add too many also. So there is some trade off there. You're right. Uh, so we are also, uh, interestingly finding very interesting things, uh, that happen when you promote shape awareness. Uh, this is from the ImageNet C, uh, data set where, uh, pictures are, uh, you know, corrupted with, uh, very severe types of, uh, effects like, you know, blur and fog and other things that really break apart, you know, standard classification networks. So the top is blur. The second half is fog. These are simulated conditions clearly, but what we find is uh, even under these conditions, uh, our shape aware modules pick up shape much more clearly than standard models can. Uh, we are integrating these notions to with generative models. You know, generative AI is the big one now. Uh, and again, one of our recent CVPAR papers was how do you add this to a generative model? Uh, the motivation is uh, simple. You know, if you take standard generative models, they again do a very good job of color and texture. And one of the standard things you will read about in the news is, oh, someone generated a human body, but it got six fingers or seven fingers. Shape, again, this is about shape, not color and texture. They're getting the color and texture and general layout fine, but unless you're promoting shape awareness, you will make these mistakes. Uh, but then shape awareness is hard to build. Uh, so we are taking some initial steps into promoting shape awareness into generative models. Uh, what we are able to do right now, I mean, I don't think we've solved the six finger problem in generative AI yet. Uh, uh, but what we're able to do is we have been able to reduce the number of parameters of generative models by order of, you know, like 4x. Like this is our generative model, uh, which has shape aware modules. And it's like 46m parameters uh, doesn't scale with the number of resolution you have, uh, but still extremely competitive in image quality. Uh, to go all the way to, you know, text to image models, we still have to add a text processing layer to it. We don't have that yet. This is still very much just a plain old GAN. But if we add a text module to it, it will start beginning to look like a DALI version of that. Uh, but we haven't done that yet. And I don't know if you have the resources to, to do it, frankly, maybe with industry partners, maybe. We can. Uh, so this is other stuff we are working on. Uh, again, uh, one of the benefits of promoting shape awareness, uh, one of the other, I would say, sanity checks are really promoting shape awareness is to try and find parameters in your network that are shape-like. Uh, what I did not mention is in our generative model, we, there is some interesting stuff we are seeing. You know, some parameters here that we are calling affine transform parameters are encoding that shape structure. 
And when you swap out one one image's shape parameters with the other ones, uh, we can generate these kinds of morphs. We can generate shape preserving morphs, or we can generate texture preserving morphs. Uh, this is extremely difficult to do with standard GANs unless you have very special types of training where you have a disentangling network and a disentangling uh, supervis supervised loss. We are able to do that with none of that. Uh, so these are some interesting results that we have to share. Uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, 10 more minutes left. So I will begin to wrap up. Uh, uh, so we have a bunch of other applications in interactive media that I really won't have time to get into. Uh, but I'll just mention very briefly that we have a very long body of work in applying some of the same principles to uh, physical therapy types of applications where we look at human movement and try to compute certain features of movement in real time so that you can drive feedback of that movement quality to a human for physical therapy. One example being stroke rehab. Uh, we have this uh, long-standing partnership with USC and Northwestern on uh, motion capture solutions where we want to promote, you know, uh, smoother movements and better coordination of movements, but the features that are interesting are often of a geometric type. When you say things like uh, coordination and symmetry, uh, those are really geometric concepts, and we are uh, uh, we are doing a very conceptual take on the problem, uh, which is if you have let's say a multi-body movement, uh, one of the intrinsic ways in which you represent the human body is through joint angles, uh, the angles between key joints. If you want to process multiple angles in one shot, uh, first of all, angles are a very tricky thing to deal with. Angles have this wrap around effect, right? Once you go beyond two pi, it wraps around. If you treat it as a regular signal, you will treat that wrap around as a high frequency something, which is not what it should be. It's really a smooth transition, which has been wrapped around because of you know, uh, the way we write signals in. The natural way to think about angle data is as uh, as circular signals. Or if you have multiple angles to deal with, you think of them as trajectories on products of circles, uh, which geometrically is called a torus. So we have been conceptually playing with uh, these types of signal representations where we think about trajectories on spheres, trajectories on tori, uh, and what we find is uh, smooth movements in hum in real physical sense correspond to geodesic trajectories on these geometric spaces. And deviations from smooth movements or optimal movements that therapists would say are good uh, can be measured as deviations from that geodesic. Uh, once again, we are not the only ones doing this. Some of this has roots in uh, robotics. Uh, articulated chains of you know, robotic hand manipulators are often represented as uh, trajectories on tori-like spaces. And uh, but they treat it as an optimal control problem. We are treating it as a machine learning problem where the trajectory is given to you and you're trying to map it to a good bad score, so to speak, uh, that correlates with the therapist score. Uh, so lots of geometry comes in naturally when you pay attention to the phenomena. Uh, but if you, you can always ignore geometry and treat everything as if it's a linear space or you can treat everything as if it's a regular signal. But what we are consistently finding is you can explain the phenomena, you can explain the performance better, you can improve the performance better, you can uh, make things more uh, reliable and interpretable if you just pay attention to the phenomena. Uh, and geometry comes in a few different ways. Uh, it's, I would say, rather than pick one type of nonlinear geometry, uh, the way to think about geometry is that it's a Swiss knife of nonlinear ways of thinking. Uh, and it's an interesting way to think about uh, invariances in, in uh, machine learning, which uh, a lot of people talk about, but they don't really know how to enforce invariant you know, conditions. So those are the kinds of tools you have when you deal with geometry. So I'll wrap it up right now. Uh, and uh, in summary, I think uh, uh, our approach is, is a new type of machine learning approach. I'd say it's a hybrid machine learning uh, approach where we are leveraging contemporary advancements in machine learning. Uh, most of our work is to advance uh, certain, you know, specific ways to understand phenomena and reduce the number of parameters you need to explain that variation by explicitly encoding them as geometric functions. Uh, the specific type of geometry is different in every case. That's where I would still say it's uh, a lot of, you know, uh, hypothesis testing. You have to know a lot of tools and you have to know a lot of techniques and then find the right match. Uh, the way I think about how AIML can proceed, at least at a curricular level, 
is uh, the tools are not mature. I mean, standard architectures are mature. You can download them. High school kids are not doing it. I mean, I get high school students who do, <laughs> who can do better ML than me, uh, but then they don't have the tools to ask the why question. What are the sources of variation? Why do they exist? That's a pivot that I would like to encourage uh, where we treat machine learning tools as uh, off the shelf things, but we engage on the why conversations more. And it takes time. I mean, that means you have to read strange books. You have to read physics and material science and biochemistry and whatnot. Uh, but I think that's a very productive way on the educational side, at least. Uh, with that, uh, yeah, I'm happy to wrap up. And I've been fortunate to receive uh, basic support from lots of agencies. And uh, I'm really seeking industry partners to begin to take these things to the next level. Uh, so we've had a very good 10-year run on the basics, but now I'm hopeful to transition them to industry. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah. Happy to take questions. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, thanks a lot. So, yeah, the floor is now open for questions. Uh, anyone from the audience uh, want to ask anything? Oh, there are some chat questions, which I did not read. Uh, yeah, I think Tauhidur was here for uh, for a brief period of time. Uh, ah, he, he, yeah, I know him. Yes, know him, right? yeah, yeah. 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 He, he actually was uh, a close friend of mine, and he lives in San Diego. Fantastic. So we meet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, he mentioned that the low rate, uh, low heart rate variability is also correlated with stress and sickness. That's sickness right. in uh, general. So I think it was uh, right. when you were showing the that graph with like four different types of variability like things that can impact variability mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. uh so so yeah i guess uh yeah so human state i mean i i, I don't know it's prob it is probably covered under one of those right uh, right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so that that i think is uh, it's more of a comment from him uh yeah uh any so, other questions yes go ahead yeah uh, yeah, I do. I really like the idea uh, of the the CVPR paper that you presented. It's it's very interesting, and uh, also opens up a lot of question like exactly how how to mix this information, uh, uh, like the other channels that you are getting as an input that the, with the index values and uh, uh, so so. Did you see like how how did you determine like exactly what way yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I don't think we have a very uh, clear answer to why that specific architecture, but I think all we knew was uh, we had to, you know, we were looking at the dot product between the image function and the polynomial function. So we wanted to have a pipeline that would learn polynomial functions, but then if it's polynomial functions, there is no dependence. I mean, it's like learning basis functions, right? There is no dependence on the given picture. We are just learning functions on the image grid. So yeah. we knew that the input to that lower pipeline had to just be a matrix that was the size of the image. And uh, sure, it could be uh, initialized by image coordinates, which is what we're doing. But uh, fundamentally, it's uh, it could be a random noise picture. I mean, that might also work out that we start with just noise pictures sort of like the diffusion ways of thinking, maybe it learns to denoise that to look like a polynomial function. So I think the the beginning point was not clear, but we knew that we wanted to end with something that looked like a 2D polynomial function, which could then be multiplied with an image feature. Uh, but I think starting with coordinate grids was uh, uh, a good idea, but I don't think it's the only way to do that, yeah. Did you visualize that uh, if it is indeed is a is some sort of like known function? function. Yeah. Uh, yes, give me one sec. So we have some of those visualizations in the supplemental material, uh -huh. and I should have put that in the presentation. But let oh, me pull up fine. the paper real quick. Yes, they, I mean I I would not say that I can visually recognize them as polynomials, but I think I would say they look like interesting blobs. So which is mm -hmm. which is what it is. Uh, let's see, improving shape awareness. Let's see if we find the supplement. Ah.
uh, while I keep hunting for it, if I'm happy to take other questions. <laughs> oh no, uh, let me just go. Okay, also, so, uh, for, for I I found deep, deep neural networks, sometimes we kind of assume that the network will kind of in a data driven fashion learn how to handle right. handle the input, right? Yeah. Uh, so so people sometimes tend to even not do much of a pre processing, right? Or right. Yeah. Or like apply any human level knowledge of how to like pre processing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I have I have an answer to that. So yeah. before I get to that, so yes, so these are the types of polynomial oh, functions that this it is learned. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, again, I can't just read off. The function that it's learning from here, but uh, mm -hmm. they do look like uh, blobs of different types and shapes and orientations, uh, which is uh, what we need uh, to represent shapes in that way. Uh, so to come to that other question, which is, should they learn without any human input? Uh, my response is two things. One is, even when we say that a network was architected, someone has thought through those decisions. And the point we're making is the decisions that people have made have the texture bias uh, because you know why convolution you know why not some other operation you know uh, no one's ever justified that to me <laughs> it's 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 an architecture that seemed to have worked and then we have run with it but uh, that's that's what I mean so someone has already thought through right I mean there is human input there it's not just given to us that convolutions are the right things to do for example uh, same with transformers I mean it's very unintuitive why I mean there's so many different architectures one could come up with uh, nearly all of them in some ways exhibit some bias uh, based off of how they were conceived. I mean, the transformers ways of thinking is so unintuitive to apply to vision. I mean, it's it's uh, the language ways of thinking about things, yeah. right? Yeah. Why would you apply a language way of thinking to a picture? Sure, it works. So there are all these yeah. biases that we don't fully understand, uh, which come because, uh, yeah, we haven't thought about this hard. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the shape bias is similar. I mean. There is no reason why the first layer should not be, you know, this kind of, you know, coordinate grid type of thing. Uh, but again, that might create a shape bias if if that were the only thing that was done. Uh, so there is that, that mm -hmm. I think all architectures come with uh, some baggage and yeah. we, we accept them because they work. Uh, the other is, uh, will we ever get away? Will there ever be a very generic architecture that can... Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, you know, the mathematical theorems say doesn't matter, right? I mean, no matter how you architect something, the representation theorem says as n tends to infinity, as the number of parameters tend to infinity, oh, they yeah. will represent all functions. Yeah. Uh, but again, the trouble is we don't know what that n tending to infinity means. So as far as engineering is concerned, I think there is going to be a lot of space for those finite parameter models where these yeah. choices will make a difference. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. But, uh, yeah, the shapes that you showed, like the grad cam images, they're very impressive. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's great. Yeah, happy to send you a quote uh, if you want to play with it. Uh, <laughs> <You know. laughs> yeah, if it's on Git, yeah, if you, sure. If it's available somewhere, then, yeah, yeah, I take a look. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if, if there's no other question, I I don't think the audience. Uh, I mean, I haven't heard from the audience uh, anymore. So uh, I think we can wrap it up. Appreciate uh, it. Oh, yeah. Yes. Hey. Oh, okay. Thank you, John. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, it was very nice. Uh, Interesting talk, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I worked on this stuff way, way back when it was all linear. I was working on big data when it was small. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now it's slowly getting out of hand, I think. And, uh, <laughs> and too much data like being yeah. produced every day. So I was, I, yeah, the other day I was talking to Tawhidur. Actually, we had, I, was, I was saying like there should be now something called uh, like data recycling where you also <laughs> start thinking about <laughs> how to how, how it would be like a safe way to get rid of some data <laughs> interesting <laughs> uh, nice. yeah right uh, like same with data sets also right at some point you have to 
kind of move on and mm-hmm. say like, okay, yeah, enough with this particular data set. Maybe right. So, <laughs> right, right now there is no central governance on any of this, right? Like no, no governance on like what data set you are so you, you should take as the 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 kind of state of the art thing to 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 show something uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, and that i think is a is a big problem because there are papers coming up with new and new data sets kind of like every month now <laughs> so <laughs> so things are quite uncertain i think and yep. yeah i mean also exciting yep. yeah yeah okay well, thank you gentlemen yeah Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you so you much. Appreciate it. Please shoot time. me email if you have questions or comments. Happy to receive them. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.